So my name is Kellick. I'm here to teach beginning embroidery. And the, the first most important thing that we need to, to cover on embroidery is uh, safety first. Uh, embroidery is super dangerous. Uh, and it's, it's always most important to, to wear proper protective gear while you're doing your embroidery. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, my squire to be, uh, Torsten is on the phone and he was wearing his helmet too. Uh, I had put out a challenge to have people uh, wear helmets for four hours as we were trying to gear back up um, for the SCA to reopen, or for the midroom to reopen. Uh, so my name is Kellick. I am an embroidery laurel here out in the middle. And this is gonna be a class covering uh, beginning embroidery. We have a two hour period here. Uh, we're gonna cover the, the beginning stitches. We're gonna cover what embroidery is, beginning stitches, what tools you need, what kind of projects you can do, um, all that kind of things. If anybody has any question during this, this class, uh, feel free to stop me and we'll talk about it. Um, if there's a particular type of embroidery that you want to talk about, uh, ask and we can make sure we get that covered. With two hours, we'll have, have plenty of time for that. Uh, are there any questions to begin? Okay, great. Uh, so what is embroidery? Um, embroidery is decoration uh, using, uh, it can be, it's predominantly done with threads onto a, a piece of fabric. Um, embroidery is decorative. It's usually not structural. There are, are some decorative sewing stitches that people will use. And those kind of are, are a, a kind of a gray area to my mind. When I think of embroidery, I think of uh, an embroidery project. I think of um, purely embellished work. Uh, and that can be done. There's a, a wide variety of embroidery um, from just simple running stitches to elaborate gold work to, to anything in between. Um, embroidery was done, uh, I don't know what the, the earliest piece of embroidery we've, we've found is, but it's, it's really early. We found really early period examples. We found embroidery throughout the world. Um, we found it throughout the entirety of the SCA period. Uh, so as an example of some things that you can do for embroidery. Embroidery was done for things like, uh, I'm gonna show you some projects that I have here at my house. So this is a, a tunic that I made for my wife and I did um, some counted thread work for the sleeves. Uh, so she does Serbian. So, uh, and we found some examples of, of that kind of work being done there um, with red and white. So I made her some sleeves. Uh, this is, um, we're not gonna talk about this quite as much, but here is a, a hood that has along the base, it has a combination of applique and some, uh, some vine, some small chain stitch for the, the vine work in between. So the, the leaves and the flowers are all done with applique. Uh, and then connecting them, we have vine work that was done in um, some chain stitch. We have, uh, you can make pouches. So this is a, a, a brick stitch bag or a counted thread bag that I made for myself. Um, it's pretty big, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than most uh, historical examples, but I wanted to be able to fit my cell phone and other things in it. So it's big. Uh, this is an, uh, an example of a bag I made for my wife. Um, it's like an alms purse. It's a, a lot smaller. It's embroidered on both sides. This is an example of a 14th century piece. Um, and they had tassels along the, the bottom. Sometimes they had tassels on the side. They had hanging cords and drawstrings. It looks like since I've last seen it, it uh, lost a drawstring or lost a little tassel. Um, that's okay. Uh, so this bag um, and the period examples, it's a little bit different than what the period examples would have been. Uh, this is completely embroidered with split stitch in the background, uh, but the period examples would have had gold work. Um, and what I learned uh, while doing this is that by doing all split stitch on the whole background, it really added to the time on this project. So I don't think it was as historical as it could have been, and it took a lot longer than I think it needed to. Uh, so I guess the I paid for the the sin of of not following the period way. Um, so I, I feel like I had did my penance. Uh, I have you can have with uh, a couple simple techniques. This is a a hood that I made. So along the the bottom, there are there's a band of embroidery, and this was done with just two different stitches. Uh, the thicker band was done with chain stitch and then the circles were done with a uh, stem stitch. Um, and then I embroidered along the, the tail too. Um, and to my mind, uh, there are, uh, I can show you here. Oh, and I'm gonna show a pouch, another hood. This is a hood that was made for, for me. And on the front here, we have an embroidered uh, gold dragon. 
So this uh, this dragon was done in a combination of like uh, it's padded gold work. So I think that's sometimes called stump work, uh, but it's mainly or new way. So it's all done in gold thread. Um, and I don't know if the light will hit it quite right that you can see, but the, the body of the dragon has a green sheen to it. And that green sheen comes from all of the couching stitches for the, the dragon. So it's all gold uh, thread that's just been couched down. Um, and then it's been given texture by the padding that was placed underneath it. Uh, Master Caradwin um, made this uh, for me um, like eight years ago. Uh, and it was really beautiful then and it's still beautiful now. Uh, she does great work. Um, she is a, a jewel of the kingdom uh, in more ways than one as she's is currently our, our seneschal too. So she's great people. Um, I'm gonna show a couple more examples of, of things. I'm gonna pull up the, the class documentation that I have. We have some examples in there. Okay, I'm gonna pop over here and share my screen real quick. So in the handout we have, we have a bunch, it will have some, doc, and some information it's going to have some of the decisions that we're going to go over, but then they have uh, basic um, examples of uh, embroidery that was done in period as well. Uh, so this was um, embroidery on a cloak. So this was uh, the mammon burial. So we have some faces and we have uh, this is what I think was on a tunic or this it says cloak embellishment. So there was embroidery done there. This is a picture from the Bayou Tapestry, uh, which is, is huge. It tells the, the story of the invasion of England by uh, William the Conqueror. Uh, so embroidery was used to make tapestries. Um, here, when I when I say I believe, we don't have any uh, hoods that have embroidery on it. But when I look at the the figure to the left and the right, both of them, I think, if you look at the the hoods that they have been given, they have embroidery. They have a white line along it, and then some dots. And they have a white line over here. Uh, to my eye, I think that it, it's a reasonable. Uh, extrapolation that that is an example of embroidery that was done on a hood to give it a little bit of deck a uh, little bit of decoration um you could also make maybe a case that i don't know if this is i'd like to see it in color to see if down here if this was also embroidered along the the hem um and it might also be trim uh this is a, an example this is a 14th century uh, uh lover's purse like what i was trying to do um and if we were to look at this one here what we can see uh it's the background, it's done in gold work. And if you look at it, it looks like a little, it has a little bit of a chevron-y pattern to it. Um, and that chevron pattern comes from the way that they couch down the gold threads. Um, they couch them down and they, they offset the stitches so that it would give it the, the lines that we see in the background. Uh, so that's a little bit like the, the dragon we showed is a furtherance of, of kind of that technique. Um, this is a little bit earlier before that. And then we have, um, Silk shading is what we would call it now, done over the, the figures uh, where they're using em the embroidery threads to, to give it some shading and some color. Uh, and they're following the curves of, of the body and the clothing that they have. Uh, and I think that's all the documentation that we have in there. Great. Uh, so those are some, some examples of period of techniques that could be done or things that were done in period. Um, next, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, materials that you would use, including what kind of thread, and what kind of ground. So when we're doing embroidery, you have uh, thread uh, that you're gonna use and you have uh, the fabric that you're going to do the embroidery on. The fabric that you're gonna do the embroidery on is called the ground uh, and then the thread is just a thread. I don't know that I have a better term for it than that. Uh, there are lots of different types of threads that can be used. Um, let's see, we'll start here. So this is some wool, maybe over here would look better. So then I'll, I'll show it under here. Uh, so we have lots of different types of thread. This is an example of wool. So this is some, some chunkier wool. You can also, this, uh, this is one, I wouldn't want to pair this down anymore. So this is, this is all the ply that we have. Um, and then, oh, I had, I thought my thinner wool was right here, but it's not, it's right here. I think one of the best parts about teach about Zoom classes are that all of my things are right here. Uh, I'm in my workshop, I can grab whatever I need. Uh, so that was one type of wool. We also have this, here's a, a red wool that's a lot finer. Um, so you're able to see just with the different types of, of thread, you can have different uh, effects that you're gonna be able to achieve. Uh, so the wool was, would have been used in period. 
uh, there would have been linen would have been used. So this is an example of some linen thread. Um, it's not quite as great when we're, usually I'd pass these around. Um, it's linen thread. Uh, it's a little bit coarser than silk. Um, and then you can have uh, silk thread too. So we have, here's an example of one type of silk. Here is another type of silk. Uh, and then you can also have for uh, gold work or for other types of that, you can have um, you can have some gold threads. I should pull it out of the plastic bag. This is one type of gold thread. This is uh, uh, this part here is a tube that you can cut and then uh, you can run your thread through that or you can also couch this down. We, I also have some, some uh, silver threads. Silver would have been used as well. And this is just silver uh, thread. Uh, it's not a tube. You can, we also have um, gold threads that are the same. So you can have a variety of different metals. And then you can have, uh, you could have sometimes for some of the period embroidery, you could have some spangles or even pearls would have been used. Uh, so here are another example of some spangles. Those aren't showing up well at all with this bag. Okay, so here are some spangles. They're just little metal discs that have a hole punched in the center. Um, but they can add a little bit of a pop to a piece. Uh, so that we've talked about linen, we've talked about wool. Uh, so for threads, what I didn't mention is cotton. Um, cotton, I do have, so here is some cotton DMC thread. Uh, and if we were to look, compare that to, oh, where is my, that ran from me. Uh, if we were to compare that to some, some silk, they have a similar look to them. Uh, so, but cotton was not a, a thread that they had readily available in period. Uh, cotton is, is um, at least in Western Europe. Uh, so cotton was not something that was, was readily used. Um, with that said, it comes in a wide variety of colors. It's readily available um, and it's a reasonable facsimile to, to silk. So if you're beginning or if you have trouble, if you want to have a, uh, if you have a more limited budget uh, or if it's just tough, uh, I think um, cotton is an okay thing to, to be to get started on. Um, I am not the embroidery police. I, I'm not here to be like it wasn't done in silk. It's it's garbage. No, all embroidery is great. Um, I to me, I like using silk more, but that's because I am a huge snob, as my wife will tell you. Um, I also like using wool, uh, but that's me. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is what fabric to use, what kind of ground you want to use. If I'm doing just general embroidery, if I'm going to be making something I'm going to hang on the wall, or if I'm making a bag, uh, I will do my embroidery using linen. Uh, I have found linen to be the, the best for just doing most kind of embroidery. Um, with that said though, if I were embroidering a wool tunic, uh, I would probably embroider the wool tunic, I'd, I'd embroider probably right on the wool uh, and I'd probably use wool thread. So um, when you're determining what uh, material to use for the project, it's important to remember what the project is, uh, what it's going to be used for. Um, so if I were doing a, a wool tunic, I'd probably do wool embroidery thread. Um, if I were doing a, a linen tunic, I would probably use, I might use silk, maybe I'd use wool. Uh, I might even use linen. Um, so it's about a combination of what you're doing. Um, there's also cases of embroidery being done on, um, of embroidery being done on a strip and then later having that sewn to the garment. And then when you're done with that garment, cutting off the embroidery so it can be reused. So embroidery was done that way too. Uh, so that's the, the ground. Next, we need to talk a little bit about the, the tools that were gonna be used. Um, we have, I have a hoop set up here. Uh, so we have a, a hoop. Uh, ooh, so we have a hoop here. We have a, a hoop here. Um, hoops are are not medieval. Uh, they they weren't done in period. Um, 
if we look at, I have a book here that shows a period example. This is, that's upside down. So here is a book. And if we look at the front cover of it, we have people who are working on a frame. They have it set up, right? These are people who are more doing like tapestry embroidery, but they have both of their hands free. They're not on a hoop. Um, I think we can show a picture in here also of how the work was being done. So right here is another example. They have the embroidery, or maybe they're sewing. They have a trestle set up. Um, and oh, right here, here is a, a primate period, a, a picture of people doing embroidery. Here they have it uh, done on a set of trestles. The lady there has it set up. Um, and so I, I actually have a, a set of trestles right here. So I have my trestles and then you can have a, a slate frame is what they, they call it. That's really big. So I have a, a big frame and that frame can be set across the trestles uh, to enable your, your hands to be free to work. Um, and doing that gives you a, a lot of advantages. Uh, having your both your hands free is really beneficial when you're doing things like uh, gold work or, or silk shading. Um, with that said, uh, it's a lot more of an investment. It's a, a lot harder to get. It's a specialty tools. Um, so a hoop uh, is a, a reasonable modern uh, thing to use. Um, and then I found uh, a, a good setup here is I have an embroidery hoop that came with a, a, a stand. So with this stand here, um, I, can, I can actually raise and lower the arm here. So I can adjust the height uh, and then I can sit on it. Um, so I've often sit, uh, been working on this and having this sit underneath me or you, I could clamp it to the table uh, and I'd still have both my hands free to work. So that's really, really beneficial. Um, the other tools that you really need for it are you need uh, um, some scissors, uh, you need uh, needles, um, and I like to use uh, beeswax on occasion. Uh, and then if we were ta to talk about gold work at all, you have gold work breaks into additional specialty tools. Uh, where are they at? So I, you, I have special gold work scissors. They, to cut the metal threads, they're serrated. Did this flip on me? I think, it, I don't know if it flipped or not. So we have those. I also have a laying tool right here to help with uh, pushing and pulling. Um, so you can, this will help you, this can help you lay down your tool, your stitches exactly where you want when you're doing gold work. Uh, so especially projects have specialty tools. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, can I ask a fairly specific question to a project I have in mind? Yeah, and if I don't know, either I can research it or can get you an answer later, or maybe I'll know. I'm sure you know. I'm sure you have an opinion. I've just gotten multiple opinions. So I want to do a pretty large piece for uh, on the back of a cloak. Okay. And it sounds like you're suggesting if you were to do something like that, you would go straight onto the material. Do you have an opinion on applique of that versus directly embroidering onto the native material? What is the, the material of the cloak? It's... It's wool. Okay, and uh, what are you gonna do the embroidery in? Uh, I, based off of what you just said, probably wool now. Okay. I haven't bought anything, so I don't have an investment yet. Oh, that's cool. So if I were doing, I, I, I probably would embroider right on the, the wool. Um, if, it's a, if it's a thin wool, I might back the wool first. I might back it in a, give it a little bit of body or volume. Um, so it's kind of, that's another thing that I should have heard. If uh, I've done embroidery on silk before and silk is really uh, kind of light and flimsy. Um, and when I've done that, I've backed it with uh, a linen before, like I've sewn the two pieces of linen, the linen and silk together to give the, the uh, silk a little bit more body to give it a little bit more rigidity to help with that. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on, I'd really want to see the wool. Like am I, I'm leaning towards saying that if it were me, I would do the right against the wall um, but I'd want to to see uh, and then I, I guess it also depends maybe on how intricate the motif is too okay we so, can talk about it in another time I don't want to take up your class time for that but I appreciate your oh, insight okay sure
I'm happy to talk anytime. I love talking about embroidery and I love seeing people's projects. So when you, you get it going, feel free to, to show me. Will do, thank you. Okay, so we are now about ready to start talking about actually doing some stitches and getting ready. We're gonna be using a, a hoop, uh, if you have it. Um, the first thing we wanna talk, I'm, so, uh, so this hoop here right now is how we want it to be. I've, I've, this is one that's set up pretty well. Um, it's the, um, the fabric is not so tight that it's a drum because uh, embroidery is just gonna rest on the top of it. I don't wanna pull it so it's super tight. And then when I take it out of the, the hoop, it collapses in on itself because that's how you get puckers. That's how it's just, it's no good. So you want it to be nice and even, but I don't want it to be so loose that there are uh, like uh, pockets or, or places where it's kind of loose in there. Um, so what I do, uh, I'm gonna do another hoop. So I have my hoop. I'm gonna lay my, my fabric over top of that and I'm gonna put this on top. Uh, and then there's a little knob here at the top to tighten it. Um, and it, just by doing this, it made it pretty good. It's, uh, if I, I'm gonna mess up right there. So right now I have a, a big spot right here where it's, so what I want it to do is you just go around the edge and you pull it so you get out any wrinkles or puckering. And then you tighten the, the knob on the top and you maybe repeat that a little bit. So that's there, that's pretty good. Um, does anybody else have a piece of, have you uh, got a hoop done? Do you want me to take a look at it? If so, you can turn on your camera and, and hold it up and we'll take a look and see how it looks. Okay, uh, for the class, I am thinking that this, I'm gonna use uh, some wool thread because I think it's a little bit thicker. Um, and I think that that'll show up a little bit better on the camera for people to be able to see. Uh, but if you have cotton, you can use cotton um, or DMC or, or whatever you happen to have available. Uh, something to talk about is if you're using a, a cotton or a DMC, uh, where is my DMC? Is that the, it's gonna come uh, in strands. What I mean by that is it's going to have, uh, if I take it and fan it out, it has, a bunch of different threads. Um, that you can see. Uh, and so it's important to when you're doing that to figure out how many threads, you, how many strands you want to use if it comes in as a stranded thing. Um, for most embroidery, if I'm using like cotton or, or silk, I'll use um, two or three. Uh, for some projects I've used four. Uh, but oftentimes when I'm doing it, I will, when the, when this is done, this is done by a mechanical process and they have it twisted. So they'll be under a lot of tension. So I will oftentimes, if I'm going to do it with this, I will take it and break out all of the strands into their own so that the, I'm, I'm taking off all of that tension um, before I knew it. So now these are, will give a little bit better coverage. Um, and sometimes if I, if I feel like they're getting out of my, out of uh, hand, that might be when I'm going to run them through uh, some some beeswax. Okay, so I'm going to thread my needle. Uh, I have found with a, a thicker one, I will. I've had good luck if I take my, I have my thread wrapped around my needle. I'm going to pull it off and then feed it through the the eye that way. So now I have a, a threaded needle. Okay, I'll do that again on the, the camera on the top, if you wanna switch. Yep, go for it. So if, I, if I'm trying to thread a needle and I have something that's kind of chunky, I will take my needle, I'll loop it over top, and then I'll pull it. So now I have like a, a chunky kind of bit. And I found that, ooh, the first time that worked really smooth and now it's not gonna work smooth for me. That is right there. There we go. So by bending it, I gave it a, an easier place and I then I pull it through. Um, yep, that looks great. Now I have my tail. Okay, so I have that. 
I am now going to talk about the, the most controversial topic that we'll talk about in the, the entirety of this class. Uh, and it's the, the great knot debate, uh, whether you should use a knot in your embroidery or whether you should not use a knot. Um, embroiders will come to blows. We'll, we'll fight it out on the streets and people will be punching and kicking. Uh, I'm here to tell you that if you look at uh, in medieval embroidery, you'll find knots. You can look at the back of a, of the, of a piece of embroidery, you'll find knots. Um, so knots are period. Uh, you also find, we have this idea um, that we want the back of our embroidery to look as good as the front of our embroidery. And that's also a bit of a, a modern uh, idea. Um, if, you were, if you were to look at the back of some period embroidery, uh, you'll see that if they were doing one color over here and they had the same color over here, they would just run the thread over and do it. Um, that bothers my sensibilities. Um, so I don't do that. Uh, but it's a period technique to do it that way. I'm just not a fan. Um, and it's easy enough to not do that. So I will show you how to put a knot on. And then if you, then I'll show you how to not use a knot. So we'll cover both ways. Um, so to, to, to put a knot on it, the easiest way that I have found is I will pinch it. I will wrap it around my finger twice. And then I roll my fingers back and forth. I pull it off. And then I have this thing right here that I pull down. And now I have a knot. Um, I usually will trim that up a little bit to make it not quite as ugly. Voila, I have a knot. Um, I'll do that one more time. So I'm going to take my finger, I'm pinching it once, twice. Then I'm gonna roll my, use my thumb, roll it together, I roll it off and I'm gonna pull it down. And now I have a, a knot that I need to trim up a little bit. So I trim it and voila, I have, I have a little knot. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Um, and that's perfectly okay to use. Um, I'm going to jump over. We're going to start doing some stitches here uh, in just a minute. And when we get there, I'll show you how to not use a knot. Um, but I should, I need to give a little bit more background first. So when I'm thinking about embroidery, uh, I think of, I break up most embroidery stitches into one of two categories. Either it's a outlining stitch uh, or it's a filling stitch. Um, and some stitches can be used for both, but uh, they usually, they're kind of one or the other. Um, so when I'm doing my embroidery, I like to start uh, from the, if I have a big motif, uh, say I were embroidering, um, we'll talk about embroidering uh, this bag. So when I was embroidering this bag, I wanted to start on the center and work my way out. I don't wanna start on the, the very edge and work my way in. Um, I've always had better luck. Uh, maybe the other side, it might be a better example. So I would, I would start with like this figure and work my way out. Um, rather than starting on the outside and working my way in. Uh, because what I have found is if I do it from the, the center going out, my tension is a little bit better. Uh, and that's not to say that there's never a time or a place to do it the other way. Um, these are just general rules uh, that uh, tend to give a better product is what I have found. Um, but there's always exceptions. There's always a, a time where like, well, I couldn't have done it that way. Okay, that's okay. Then don't do it that way. Um, it's These are just how I have come to do it. Uh, and I try to you do um, light colors to dark colors whenever possible, especially if I'm doing white followed by red. What I have found is if I do a red section first and I have a white section right next to it, when I bring the white up, it, ha it tends to have a tendency, it tends to pick up a little bit of the red as I'm coming up, but I have not found the opposite, or at least it hasn't been noticeable. If I have the white laid down first and I bring the red up, the red doesn't seem to pick up any of the white. So that's that's really, that's me and maybe that's, maybe I need to design my projects better. Uh, but when you're in the middle kingdom and you're doing pails and things like that, uh, that comes up. Uh, so I try to do white before red uh, and that has been good. Um, and then it's also, do you do out like we have on these, we have figures on here. Do you do the outlines first or do you do the, the, the faces first? Um, and I've done it both ways. Sometimes I, I will do an outline and then I will come in and fill it in. And sometimes I'll fill in something and then do the outline after. Um, so I don't have a, a strong feeling. I, can't, I think that depends on the project and how I'm trying to do it. Um, 
Okay, so we are now ready to begin some embroidery. We have our threads, we have our needles threaded, we have uh, fabric on our hoop. The first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna do a stitch called um, a stem stitch. And stem stitch uh, and outline stitch are kind of the same. Uh, they're for their outlining stitches or um, line stitches. So I'm gonna draw a little bit of a line here on my, my fabric. Uh, let's see. Okay, and I'm gonna end this, I'm gonna pretend that I have a section over here that I wanna, that's eventually gonna be filled in because I wanna show you how to, to start without using a knot. One of the ways to start without using a knot. So I have a little box here that I'm gonna pretend maybe I'm embroidering some kind of art new wave eye and this is the eyebrow and this is the eye. I don't know, um, but I'm gonna tie, I'm, I'm gonna counterintuitively, I'm gonna tie a knot in my thread. So my, my thread has a knot and I'm gonna start over in this box on the top. I'm gonna do a couple stitches. So right now I can't pull it anymore. So I'm going to come down once, twice. And so this is this would ideally be done in a section that would be getting covered with other threads. Um, but it's a good way to, to start without a knot. So I have a knot. I've done two stitches. Now I'm going to take this. I'm going to pull it up and cut that knot off. So there's no longer a knot. Um, and my I'm pulling on this. I pulled it way too hard. Uh, but I pulled it through. If you don't pull as hard as you can, it won't come out. Um, but that's all well and good. So that's one way of doing it is put a knot, go down from the top, do a couple stitches and cut the knot off. Another way is I'm going to leave my tail long. On, and when I come up, I'm just going to do a couple of stitches with the uh, long tail. Um, and this would be ideally if I were filling in a section, I'd have it done that way. Um, and by doing a couple of stitches, it's secure. And then when I get, well, eventually we'll get to where we're, we're finishing and starting more stitches. I could, when I finish it, I'm gonna run it this, the needle through a couple of stitches on the back and then snip it. Uh, and then once I've started it with, I'm gonna start again, I could then run them under a couple of stitches that are already done and then start them that way. Uh, so I have my, my stitches started. I want to do outline stitch. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do along this line right here is what I want to outline. So I'm going to come up. And I'm gonna come back down on the line. So I have a loop right here. I'm going to come up on the back part of that line. And then when I pull forward, I'm gonna go forward on the line So let's let's me get really precise on where I want my stitches to be. Mm -mm -mm. My needle came unthreaded. Uh, and sometimes when I'm threading a needle, I'll just use uh, saliva to help hold the stitch down too, or to hold the thread down. So there's lots of ways. Okay. Uh, so I want to make this one here a little bit bigger. So again, come up at the, towards the back of the stitch. Pull it forward. Come down. Uh, and then when you go around a curve, you just use, make smaller stitches or is a good way to do that. Is this making sense to people? Yeah, so quick comment, 
question kind of ish. Um, sorry about background noise here. Um, <laughs> when you're doing that on a curve mm -hmm. and you're laying the loop, um, do you generally keep that loop to the outside of the curve? I do. Um, what I have found is I like to be consistent on, on my placement. Uh, so if I, if I, it doesn't matter to me if I go above the loop or below, if I'm going ab above or below, I try to stay consistent. Um, what happens is if I, uh, if you, if you change, it's going to give you a different look. So I, I've been going above. Now, if I go below, this, the line, if you look at the line, it changes the look of the line. So see here how it was going this Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was noticing on some of the stuff I've done where I get, I forget what I'm doing partway, or if I make my spacing too wide, it'll throw that curve off and you get like, if it, you're going on the inside of the curve, it'll get choppier and look like a, more like a polygon type setup. Yep, I've often thought about it like uh, the old vector art from old video games in the 80s where they couldn't do it and they had just really big lines and you're trying to make a curve with big lines, it's gonna look a little bit less smooth. Exactly. Um, but that's not to say that you couldn't, in theory, like if you were making a, a circle, um, maybe I want it to be fatter here and here. So maybe I have them come on one way and then I have a, I change it on the back. Uh, so I could see a case being made for, for doing that. Um, but it's not something that, that I, I like to do. Um, I see Susan has her head down. So I think that means she's been so stitching. Do you, do you want to show, do you have a one you want to show? Yeah, that looks, uh, what I can, uh, the way I could see that looks really good. Okay. Um, I think everybody else that I saw in here said they are just listening or if, if anybody else wants to share, they can. If not, we're gonna move on to the next stitch. Okay, are you ready, Susan? Do you wanna get a thumbs up if you're ready? Okay, she's shaking her head, great. Okay. So we've done that. Um, the next stitch I want to show is going to be a split stitch. Um, and split stitch to me is, is kind of a workhorse. So this, this bag here, it's upside down. I don't know which way my camera is showing anything. Okay. Uh, this bag here, the figure work is all done in split stitch. Um, the whole bag is, is actually done in split stitch. So split stitch uh, is, uh, it's a, uh, if you hear of opalis anglicanum, the work of the English, uh, the, the silk uh, shading, um, that's, uh, we showed that on that pouch that we looked at earlier. Um, here is another example of it. So this is all uh, silk shading. Um, these figures heads are done in it too. This is all the, the silk shading. Uh, it's uh, a workhorse of a stitch. Um, and I often will think of it a little bit to me, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's like coloring. Um, cause I'm, I'm laying down my stitches and I'm filling in with uh, color. Uh, it's, it's very soothing to me and makes it, it to me. I often think of it like I'm doing adult coloring. Um, so we're going to do a split stitch. I'm going to jump over here to, so it's usually a filling stitch, although you could outline it. Use it for outlines. So I have a triangle right here that I want to, to embroider with the stitch. Um, so I'm gonna come back down. So to do split stitch, uh, I'm going to come up. On my first stitch, I oftentimes will go backwards because I find that I, I like having, I have more control coming from the, the top than the bottom, but that might just be me. So I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna go back down. 
So that's stitch one. And then stitch two, I'm gonna come up on the back half of that stitch. So I came up right here. And I'm gonna go forward. And then I'm going to just keep doing that. So every stitch splits a stitch, uh, generally speaking. Okay, and so I made it this figure here a triangle on purpose um, because triangles are cool uh, and I think they're underrepresented, uh, but also um, as a way to show if I were trying to fill in a section here, I've now done the center line and I did that on purpose. Um, there's a lot of different ways to fill in a shape. I could have started on one edge and worked my way over, um, but I didn't. I, I, when you're doing this kind of embroidery, it's important to think of how you want your stitches to flow. So this is also just a general statement. We'll talk a little bit more here in a moment about us, where you're laying out your stitches. But if I have a general shape that I wanna fill in, I'll, I'll take and split it down the first. And then my next set of stitches, I want to split the, the difference. So I'm gonna keep splitting and make smaller and smaller pieces so that I get a good uh, shape. Cause I'm gonna need more stitches along the bottom than I will at the top. So I need, I'm gonna need, this has more area to fill than this area up here. So if I'm coming up this way, it lets me get a little bit, I found that this lets me get a little better coverage. Well, I'm trying to direct these to the, the top of that center and that's not the best line I've ever done, but that's okay. I should have tried to get these to flow a little bit better. Okay, so I'm gonna just come up. And then I would, if I'm going back down, I would split that distance again. And you can see on my third stitch, I've already filled in a good chunk of that top, right? Up here at the peak, it's filled in. At the bottom, it's not. So by doing it this way, I'm gonna get stitches from across the, the area to fill in the whole piece. So one of the things I see, Kalik, is you can, de determining your direction of stitch can help give a feeling of motion uh -huh. to your, to your embroidery, do you find that a true statement? I 100% find that to be a true statement. Especially with the, the Opus Anglicanum, that was something that they were going for. They were trying to make it look lively. Uh, and, and to do that, one way to do that is to, to have it be shaded and to have your stitches flow in a way that would convey that motion. Um, mm -hmm. So when we do that, so uh, the last thing I wanna, uh, I'm gonna show you some more here on a moment. Um, let's say I had like a place where I needed at the end, um, we'll pretend that this is all filled in. But I have like a, a little section right here that just, that calls out for a stitch. Uh, there's nothing to say that I can't just make a stitch off by itself and call that good. Um, you don't need to have every single stitch, doesn't have to actually split into a stitch. Uh, it's okay for some of them not to. I like to use to do like a light and exercise with the arms to show uh, the way to lay out stuff. Yep, you're good, go ahead. Okay, so if I'm looking here, I have a, a light shining down on my arm. And if we're looking at this, it's lighter along the top than the bottom. And I have wrinkles in my fabric. Uh, I also have like a little place where here, uh, where it comes in. So if I were going to be embroidering this, I would want to have my stitches give this, I'd want to have them show a little bit of this wrinkling here. So I would think about where the light source was, even on my arm. I would want lighter colors at the top. And then I'd have a little bit, I might have some darker shades right here. And then a shade in the medium here. So I could go from a dark to a medium to a light based on where the light is reflecting to give that sense of movement. And I'd have my stitches come this way and I might have uh, I might have this, if I were doing a dark stitch, I might have it go 
along here and then come back down to give the, the shape of the forearm. Uh, so you are 100% correct on that, Oswin, that uh, how you contour your stitches um, will give it that sense of motion in a body. Um, that makes sense? Yep, very cool. Uh, and we can see that in the, uh, if we look here, let's see if I can get a, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna share my screen again. And we're gonna go back to here since we're talking about this. If we're looking here at the, the body, if we look at the body, the figure on the, the left, we can look at the, the stitches on the arm. They have that light source here showing lighter stitches here, then darker and then darker. And they come in, they come this direction and then they go down. And if we look at, uh, we can see the, the shape, the, the folds in his fabric along his waistline. He has his long coat pulled up and tucked in. It looks like they have uh, holes in the, the side of their garment too. So you can see their underdress uh, or their under tunic. Um, so you can see here, they, they've done the, the stitching work to show the, the wrinkles and that, and they're having it flow here to give it that, that motion and that life. Uh, and they have darker stitches along the, the hem right here. Uh, I'm looking at the, the figure on the left uh, below where his belt would be. He has a, there's a dark line coming down and then a little bit lighter, lighter until we get to the very edge of the fabric where it's the lightest color. Uh, and then on the other side, we can see where it comes down um, and they have that. Something I've often thought about on this one, uh, we can talk about later or maybe is it looks like they have some couch threads. I almost looks along the, the edge of the garment. Um, if we look at like her neckline and the neckline of the of her the bottom of her dress, to my eye, it looks a little bit like maybe they, should, they did some couching and some more decorative work on that too. Um, I I really would like to get a, a super close up view of this one to, to see how it goes. Um, but you are correct, Oswin. Uh, thinking about where the light source is, um, especially for, for like a 14th century piece like this, uh, is important. If we were to look at um, so that's, if we're doing that type of work, if we were coming up to, here's the Bayou Tapestry, there is no real shading on this. So it, it, when we talk about shading, it also depends, uh, and this is also using um, primarily couching stitches and outlining stitches. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, we will talk about that a little bit later, but there's no real shading on, on this piece. So they didn't really care about a light source or where it's at. Um, so it depends on, on what your, your piece is. And there was no shading on the Mammon garments either. Uh, so it's important to, when you're doing a piece, to think about the context and that it would have been done in just to, to see what the techniques and what the, the, the idea on color theory was done at that. If, if getting it to be period accurate is an important thing to you. Okay. So I was talking about a triangle. If I'm filling in a shape, I like to start and come down the center. And then I like to jump over a little bit and then split that and then split it again. I go back and forth because it's going to take more stitches down here at the bottom than it will at the top. And this is going to give a nice blended feel across the whole piece. Versus if I have a, a triangle and I start filling it this way, I'm going to, all my stitches are going to end up being more like that if I follow this line. So it's, oh, I'm not trying. So if I'm following, just trying to fill in, it's going to look a little bit different. So it's it's entirely about what you're what effect you're trying to go for, is how this is going to be. Um, we talked about uh, doing an arm. So this is my attempt at an arm. I might have some. I might do the wrinkles along the arm first. I might do those. I might do those in one color, and I might have it be a lighter color right here and then maybe slightly darker and then darker still. Um, it's hard to shade when you have just one color, uh, color pencil in your hand. Um, but you, I, would do, I would do the those stitches first and then I would come back through. And then if this were all purple, I, would, I could choose which way I want my stitches to go. And I'd fill it in uh, that way so that those stitches would be filled in. Okay, um, I'm trying to think. Oh, the other thing is if I, if 
I'm embroidering a section. And I have it all filled in. Um, I might just do one stitch right here to, to finish that up, to color it all in. Okay, uh, so my thread is almost uh, at an end on this one. So I want to show you how to finish and then we're going to jump on to a couple more stitches. Uh, any questions so far? So right now this is not a very pretty back. Um, but I'm almost done with my thread and I want to start over. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to trim this up a little bit just so that you can better track what I'm doing. Okay. So I'm almost done with my thread. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to run it underneath some finished threads once, go back, loop it under again. Uh, and if I'm feeling particularly crazy, I might tie, I might loop it again and do go run through that loop and make a knot. I, I don't today, so I'm not. And then I slip it. So now these stitches over here, they're not going any, they're not going anywhere. So we're safe there. Uh, and then it's, oh, how do I start my next one? So to start the next one, I'm gonna need to rethread my needle. So I'm going to cut another thread strand. Um, when it comes to how long of a thread to work with, I don't want you. Uh, I try to be moderate on how far I'm going to go. Um, this is a little bit short, but it was getting into a knot. Um, I don't want to have things that are so long that I have to pull my whole arm. Every stitch that you do, you're going to have to pull this whole thing out, except for where it's what's been over. So you have a little bit of a limit. You can't go further really than your, your arm length. Um, but like 18 inches is about maybe the longest I would do, 18 to 24 inches. Okay, so I got my, my needle threaded. Then to start my next set of stitches, I'm gonna bring it to the back. And I'm going to run underneath once, so there's no knot here. Let's trim that away. Okay, so I have no knot. I'm gonna go under once, twice, I might even go under a third time. So I've gone under three times and then I can I don't normally like to do, like I wouldn't do this with a, an actual product, but I'm lifting it right now with that thread uh, and it's not going anywhere. So it's super okay to do it that way and you don't have to worry about it pulling out or, or uh, I don't have a knot so it's going to be broken. No, you're okay. Okay, the next stitch I want to talk about is going to be um, a chain stitch. Chain stitch can be used as an outlining stitch. It can also be used as a filling stitch. Um, I found that if I do rows of chain stitch next to each other, I can make it look a little bit like dragon scales or maybe feathers um, or chain mail. Uh, so it has some nice decorative effects that way. Uh, it also can work out pretty quick. Um, I can also, if I were doing like vine work, uh, it's really handy to do, to use that for vine work. Um, on this hood, the hood that I made, uh, this line right here is, was done in chain stitch. Uh, the circle was done in the stem stitch that we did. Uh, and if you look, I had all my stitches go the same direction. So we're gonna be talking about chain stitch. So to do chain stitch, I'm going to, I'm going to draw 
we'll do it along this line right here. So I'm going to come up. I'm going to make a loop and come, I'm going back down. Okay. So I'm going back down and then I'm gonna come up in the middle of that loop and I'm gonna to pull towards the top of the loop and that made a little chain, a little loop. Then I'm gonna come back over. I'm making a loop and I come in and I'm gonna to go towards the top. And you just uh, repeat until you're, you're done with your chain. Um, and then when you're done with your chain, I'm gonna, on the last one, I'm going to just come on the other side of that last loop and just tack it down to be done. Um, if I, when I'm doing this, if I come up and I'm making my loop, and if I pull towards the, the this is the bottom versus the top. If I pull towards the bottom, it's gonna ride up and give me a big mess. It's made a big knot. Uh, and that happens, I've, I've done that many times. What I end up doing is I kind of take the back of my needle a little bit and kind of massage and work it out so I can uh, start over, so I can keep going. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you guys the, the bonus version of doing this. So there's another way of doing this. Uh, so this was the way I had been doing it was very methodical one stitch up and down. But if I come up, I can go back down. And then using my my finger, I can push my needle back, back up and pull it towards the top. So I can do it as one kind of motion instead of uh, like two motions. And this makes it go you lose a tiny bit in precision, at least at the start but it definitely is a lot quicker. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, great. The, um, the next stitch I wanna show, it's not on the handout, uh, so this is a, a bonus stitch, it is a stitch called a uh, satin stitch. Um, and satin stitch is really, really nice. Um, it will get, it uses up a lot of thread, but it gives you a nice, uh, a nice fill. So if like I wanted to fill in, so I have a, a circle here that I wanna fill. To do satin stitch, what you do is, um, oh shoot. I got my needle on the back and it's all tied up. It's gonna take me just a second. Uh, while I'm untangling this, does anybody have any questions? Anybody hear any good jokes lately? No questions, thank you. Okay. I like that I had to thread in with a joke to get people to talk. I only know just, dad jokes. It just takes a minute for me to find my mute button. <laughs> Okay. Dad jokes are great, um, but that's okay. So we're gonna fill in this little circle here with satin stitch. Uh, to do satin stitch, I'm gonna come up. I'm gonna go across my shape and go back down. Then I'm gonna come up next to where I came up the first time. And go over again. So you're just really doing a big loop. You're looping it around and around. Uh, and hopefully you get your stitches a little bit closer together than I'm doing. It's a little better. And you just, you do this ad nauseum um, and it's great. Uh, you can get a really precise line. I have found sometimes if I do an outline stitch first, and then I, I that gives me a guide for exactly where to bring my stitches up and down, that that can help. 
uh, and the 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 side effects. So this gives you a really good fill. Um, but on the back, you're using you're using twice as much thread. So right here we have this is where we are doing it, where my thumb is. Uh, so as much thread as you're using on the front, you're using on the back with satin stitch. Uh, you can use um, something that you could do with uh, that was done maybe in, in a little bit later. You can do uh, you could do your stitches going one direction. If I wanted to do some padded work, I could have my stitches run one direction, and then I could come back later and do another row of satin stitches and have them go the other way. Um, and that would give it uh, a little bit more of a 3D effect. Um, and that could be, that's uh, seen a little bit on cruel work and on, on stump work. Uh, let's, um, so that's uh, satin stitch. Um, any questions on that one? Okay, great. Uh, the next um, stitch we want to talk about is going to be a, a family of stitches, uh, and it's it's called couching. So, at its simplest, uh, couching is um, holding a stitch down with other stitches. So the simplest form of couching, I have I have one long stitch, and then I come up and I I couch it down. So I have one stitch held down by other stitches. That is the, the simplest version of couching that, the, that there is. Um, and from that one technique, uh, with, that, with that one idea, there are a whole mess of ideas. So that's couching, um, one stitch held down by others. Uh, that's the, the super basic version of it. I'm gonna move this a little bit lower is couching how they would have been doing like the gold work, like with actual gold? Yep, you are you are spot on. Um, it's also how the the Bayou tapestry was done was with with predominantly with couching. Uh, so this uh, that's upside down. This here is all this embroidery here is all done in couching. This is or new way. This is all gold work and all the shading was done with couching stitches. Um, this uh, figure right here, uh, or this, this is uh, part of a, uh, of a tapestry, um, the mal maltier hanging. This, uh, this here was also done all with couching. So this, this, they look different. Um, this was all done with wool. The, the, uh, the gold work is done with gold thread, but they're both couching. Um, let's find another example of couching. Here was the... So couching and the bayou stitch are the same stitch, it's just a different name? No, um, they're, this, they're related techniques. Uh, it's like, um, I would say the Bayou Tapestry Stitch is a form of couching, uh, but not every couching stitch is Bayou Tapestry Stitch. So it's like a, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Gotcha, thank you. Um, so we're gonna, I'll show you a couple of different, so we, okay. so the Bayou Tapestry, what their, their goal was, they wanted to use up as much thread as they can. So uh, I have found that, that teaching this kind of stuff with, uh, with hand, with, uh, by drawing, is, makes it a lot more easy to follow than not. So um, the basic idea with the Bayou Tapestry stitch was the, uh, we'll start with an even simpler example. Bayou Tapestry stitch, if I have a, a rectangle to fill, um, I'm going to come up here. I'm going to go across. So I have one, two. I'm going to come up next to it and come back. So three, four. And I'm going to do that until I have the whole section filled in. 
So I have stitches going this way to fill it in. Um, but these are going to be really long stitches and they're going to be loose and wobbly. I don't want that. I don't want my stitches to be loose and wobbly because they might get cut. So now I'm going to, to go 90 degrees from that. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to, they would have been done in the same color, but I'm going to grab a, a different color so that you can see. This was all done in the same color thread. Um, so then I would go across. So now I have a, a long stitch going this way, and then I would tack this one down. Then I would make another long stitch and tack it down. And I make another one and tack it down until I had it all nicely held together. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. The original sort of the floating satin, long satin stitch, let's call it. Um, how long can you go before you start running into problems? Like what's the maximum area that you can kind of fill with those long floating threads before you yeah, start coming a, back and doing it? That is a, a great question. And that is, um, that's gonna, that depends on um, a whole mess of factors on what the, what the project that you're doing is gonna be used for um, and what the materials are um, and things like that. So if you have a tapestry uh, that's hanging on the wall, uh, you maybe can get away with a little bit wider, a little bit longer stitches uh, with, with not being tacked down because it's not gonna, there, it's not like somebody's gonna, nobody should be walking up close and, and uh, catching it on something. But if you are, if you're making like um, something to go on a, a dress or on a tunic, if you have it wide enough that the stitches are puckering up while it's being moved, that's more likely to get caught on something and get ripped. So it's a, a function of what is this piece going to be when it's done will help determine how narrow your stitches to be. Um, I don't really have a, a good and fast rule on, on that for you. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking a little bit more about the Bayou Tapestry. One of the things that we, we could see on there is they didn't care uh, when we were looking at the, the silk shading, they did care about the direction of the flow of stitches. With the Bayou Tapestry, they didn't. They wanted to get the, the longest stitches that they could. So what they would do is uh, if there's places where there are arcs on there, they would have, they would first, they'd fill in like, okay, I can have my stitches running this way. So I'd have a bunch of stitches that are running this way that then would be tacked down this way, right? Then my next longest are going to be uh, this way. And then my next longest are going to be this way. And then I might have it be like that. So for the, the Bayou Tapestry, it's going to, it's the effect is they are trying to get shapes onto the fabric. They weren't trying to go for absolute realism. Uh, and I think there's a picture. Oh, I have, I know I have it in my handout. I'll share the, the screen here. So if we're, we're looking, the stitches are, you can see here, they're, they're running that way. If we look at the, the body, they're running this way, and then the arms are running this way, and then down. If we're looking at the, the at Harold here, the, the stitches are running different, different directions. And then they, they are using outline stitching to give it a little bit of uh, folds and, and give smiles and things like that. But the, the bulk of it, the work is done and couching stitches that run one direction. Okay, so we have covered all of the couching, or we've covered uh, that. Um, that's the the basic portion of, of embroidery. Uh, we I often see what people want to talk about at that point. There's we can talk about uh, we can talk about gold work. We could talk about counted thread work. Um, we could talk about Oswin's cloak. We could talk about whatever anybody wants to talk about. Is there something that, that people are interested in or a particular type of embroidery you want to hear more about? I would like to hear about counted thread work in period. Okay. I love talking about counted thread work. Um, so uh, this here is a, an example of a counted thread bag. So this whole bag is covered in, in threads that have all been counted. Uh, 
Counted thread work was also used, I'm gonna find the example here, was also used to make uh, uh, church hangings. Um, oh, here's an example of a, a cushion. Why? Oh, my phone is saying, okay. It was, my camera says it has 20% power. I'll have to plug it in. This is a cushion that was done and counted thread work. Uh, here is an example, it's in black and white, but here is an example of uh, part of a tapestry that was done in counted thread work. Um, what is that site? It is walmark.com. Let me see if I can find that. Why mark? Okay, so we'll share the screen again. So Weimark has a lot of charts. They have a lot of good periods. Uh, so this is one of the, I don't know if this is the exact pattern that the um, cushion that we were looking at is, but this is similar. So they, there's, you can find a lot of charts and things like that. Um, it's weimark.com, I'll throw that into the chat. Uh, but if we wanted to talk about, about doing counted thread work, um, let me grab out my counted thread work uh, stuff. So to teach counted thread work, I like to use plastic canvas. Uh, for counted thread work, you need to have an even weave fabric. Um, I find that I like 28 count but this is an example of an even weave fabric. It doesn't show up very well on the phone. Uh, so for teaching purposes, this is going to simulate our, our uh, counted thread. So I have a, a needle um, and we need to find a, a pattern. Uh, when, so there's uh, different types of counted thread work. Um, there are, like this here, we've, we've heard about, uh, so this is, I'm going to talk about brick stitch and I'm going to talk about um, counted satin stitch are, are kind of the two techniques that we're going to talk about. Uh, you could also, or were you, were you talking about like black work, Susan? Is that what you wanted to see or? I got excited and thought this was what? Uh, no, whatever you're doing is fine. Okay. Uh, so there's lots of different counted thread work. Um, this is the kind I'm most excited about. Uh, and I can't find the beginning of my thread. Uh, so this pouch here is uh, an example of brickwork. If I turn it sideways, if you're looking at the stitches, each row is offset. It looks like the side of a brick house. Each row, each row is halfway through each other previous stitch. stitch. Um, I don't know if that, you just got a mess. Uh, so when you got a knot, sometimes you just cut it and that's okay. So um, for this, when I'm doing my counted thread work, I'm going to uh, come up, let's keep it in this background. I come up and I'm gonna count three holes. So I came up and I'm gonna count three holes. One, two, three, and I go back down. So now that's going over five. So I'm gonna jump to on the next uh, row over. I'm gonna count down three, one, two, three, and come up. And then one, two, three, and down. And then I'm gonna come up in the hole that I went down in the first stitch. And then one, two, three, and down. And so this is building it up. This is just doing two rows right in a row. Three and down. Um, but what you find, so each one of the stitches are, are halfway through 
Uh, so the way I think about this is, is kind of like a graph. So if I have, I'm going over five holes, I come up in this hole, I count three holes, one, two, three. Oh, that's not very good. So I have five holes. I come up here, one, two, three, and I go back down. Then on my next row, so I've, I've done it at five, the midway point is gonna be number three. So I come up on number three and then I count three holes and then go back down. So each one is covering a total of five holes. I come up, I count three holes and then go back down. Um, so that's that's how to do the, the basic brick stitch. So if I, if I share the screen here, we come back out here. So if we're looking at, at this pattern, when we look at it, the, all the stitches are the same length, right? So they, there's nothing, they, if you look like in the center of it, the, the, the stitches match up here, they match up here, they go across. So the stitches are all gonna, every alternating rows are gonna be the same, are gonna have the same starting and stopping point. Um, when I'm doing this type of work, uh, this is, I would count how, how many up stitches I have. So like, I'd be like one, two, that's a lot of stitches. Um, let's see if I have something, oh, I saved it off in here. I probably didn't. Nope, I don't have it in there. Um, I do have a pattern. Uh, so if I wanted to make a diamond, um, so if I'm just going to do a, a simple pattern to show what this looks like. I come up, I'm going to count three, one, two, three, I'm going to go down. I'm going to come up in the center. So I count one, two, three on that previous one. I come up there. One, one, two, three, and down. We'll make one more. One, two, three, and I'm going to come up. One, two, three, and down. Okay, and then say I want to come back the other way. So I'm making like a, a diamond. I can count again, but I know that that this stitch and this stitch are gonna be the same, that this stitch and this stitch are gonna be the same. So I don't really need to count. I can count, um, but I don't need to. Because with this type, it's all, it's all kind of, it becomes referential. So then I even know it's gonna be right here. One, two, three, and down. And then if I wanted to come back and fill it in, my next row, I'm gonna come up right here. I don't wanna see any of the, the ground. So I come up right there. One, two, three, and down. Uh, and then I probably need a stitch in the middle. So I come up and I can count one, two, three, and then I'm gonna go down and that's gonna to touch the stitch above it, which is great. That's what I want. I don't wanna be able to see the, the ground. Um, and one, two, three, and down. And then to finish my diamond, I need one more stitch right here. One, two, three, and down. So that's the, the brick stitch type of embroidery. If we look here, we can see that this stitch, this stitch, and this stitch on alternating rows have the same, they have the same starting and the same ending point. So when you're doing it, it makes it really easy to, once you get in a flow, you can look across and say, okay, everything is matching up, I'm good. Um, if I turn it that way, I don't know which way is more helpful for you, Susan. So that's how to do, does that make sense? Or do you wanna see that, do you need to see this again? Could you do that one more time? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, 
So I'm going to come up in one hole. So I've come up in one, and then I'm going to count. I'm going to count how many holes I have. So one hole, two hole, three hole, and I go back down. So I've now gone over five. So I've gone one, two, three, four, five. I've covered five holes. I come up on the the row next to it. So I count one, two, three. That puts me right in the middle. And I'm going to count one, two, three, and down. Uh, and we'll do a, a we're just going to do a like a a really simple diamond. We're just going to have it be four stitches. So my next one needs to be. I have one up, one one here, one here. I'm going to have it be four stitches. So I'm going to come up in the middle of this one. So I count. I came down on this hole. So I want to come one, two, three. I want to come up on this hole. One, two, three. Which, if I'm looking, this hole that I just came up is the same as the previous row. So then I'm going to go one, two, three, and down. And then if I were to look here, they're the same. These, this stitch and this stitch are the same length. They cover the same number of holes. So the first stitch and this stitch are the, cover the same number of holes. And my last stitch to finish this up, I'm going to come up here. One, two, three, and down. And so I've made a, a really simple diamond where this stitch and this stitch, they both have the same, they, they cover the same number of holes. And they, they, if you're looking at it like going across, they have the same number of, they've gone to the same ones. Does that help at all? It's a little bit tricky to see over, over Zoom. That's pretty good. Okay. Do you, uh, do you want to see the more complicated version of that? Or are you, are you have I fried your brain? I think that's enough for my brain right now. Okay. There's a, a slightly more complicated version that uses uh, stitches that are a little bit smaller and a little bit bigger than that, but that lets you, that opens it up to a lot of, a lot more diversity. Um, so we have a, a half hour. Is there any other technique that anybody really wants to see? Or I could talk about setting up projects um, or anything that people want to talk about. How does underside couching work? How does underside couching work? That is a great question. Um, so that is uh, the best way to see underside couching is with uh, is with gold work. Um, so we will. I will show you underside couching. Uh, I need to get a piece of gold thread. So we have some, some gold thread. I have my fancy uh, gold uh, cutting scissors. They're serrated. So they, they're a little bit better for, for cutting gold work. Uh, we will move this up a little bit. We will move this up. So I have my, my gold thread here. Uh, if you were to look at the, the place where underside couching was done, if you're looking at like the, the pouches where it was done, um, it was done uh, with, the, with the silk or with the gold folded over. So it was done with two at a time instead of just one. So I'm gonna have two here to show you. Uh, and then I'm going to I'm going to grab a piece of red thread. Um, red shows up really well against gold. So if you look at a lot of the period examples where they were doing underside couching, they would use red thread. Um, I just used, tried to use my gold work scissors on, on normal thread and it didn't work. So it's like using your sewing scissors on paper dolls them apparently don't use gold work thread uh, scissors on on normal needles. 
Okay, so I have, I threaded a needle. I'm gonna do a stitch or two just to, to help anchor this in place, to help anchor my, my red. Uh, if I were doing this, I would do it in a different place that, uh, that would be covered. Okay, and then we're gonna tack. I'm gonna start by just tacking down the gold just to help hold it for me. Uh, and then with underside couching, what you're trying to do, what you're really trying to do is, is kind of you're making a hinge. Um, so I'm gonna come up and I really wanna go down like the, the same hole. So I've looped around the thread. And as you're pulling, um, what you'll hear, if I'm doing this right, I should hear a little bit of a pop. Because what you're doing is you're pulling the, I'm taking this, if this is my gold work, I'm taking it with my couching stitch and I'm pulling it down. Uh, so I'm making a hinge for the, the fabric or for the, the gold. And I'd come back down, come up, go down that same hole. And just give it a little bit of a tug. I don't know if I gave it a good enough tug, but I came down the same hole. So the idea is you are, you're making, you're pulling a tiny bit of the gold to the back. Uh, and there, I heard a good little pop. Um, so that they, when the bag is moving, uh, if it'll have places that it'll, you're giving it a little bit of a crease, a little place that it naturally wants to move. Um, and what that will also do for us uh, is I'm gonna share that, uh, that picture again. So the this bag here was done with underside couching. All of the gold work is done in underside couching. If you look at the, I'm looking at the area above the fellow's head. If you look, it's it's gold work, but you can see a pattern, right? You can see like a chevroni pattern or a density pattern. Um, and that is done with the underside couching where they, they, they marked out how they wanted the gold work done uh, and then they did their couching stitches in such a way to give it each row gets offset. So if you look, oh, I don't have a good pointer with this mouse. Um, but you can see the little stitches or the little couching stitches are offset just so much to give it the, the, uh, the uh, look of uh, little chevrons. Um, did so that the color is visible, but it's actually embedded uh, to where it's even with the fabric surface itself. Yeah, right. so the couching stitch you can see, like that's what the little dark spots are, or the couching stitch itself. Mm -hmm. um, so you're you're going over top of the gold work, so you're going to be able to see that uh, the red or whatever color you'd use. That's why they they used red is because the red showed off well, and I highlighted this the effect. Um, you could also, if you wanted it to blend in, you could take like a yellow and it wouldn't show quite as prominently. Okay, thank you. That makes great sense. I just wasn't sure how it worked. Um, the, the other trick, the other, uh, so um, the other big trick about gold work is what to do when you're um, with your ends. So you've done, you've done all your, your couching but then you have these, these ends down here. How do you get them to, what do you do with them at the end? Um, and that's, uh, I can show you that too, because that's, that's, some, uh, that's the, the tricky part of gold work. Um, and that's called plunging. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, you could, what you want to do is you want to get the threads to the back. The, the easiest way that I found is to take another needle. This is, this is my plunging needle. And what I've done 
is, uh, can you see that okay? I have a loop on the needle right here. So I've double threaded this needle, right? So it's coming through, I made a loop and then did that. And then what you do is wherever you wanna plunge it, your threads, you bring your, your gold work through and hopefully you're not uh, as wasteful as I am on this gold thread because you don't wanna waste stuff. But you run the gold thread through that loop and then you're going to pull it. So now I have it caught in my loop and then you pull it down. So now the it's on the back. Neat. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you can. I've also seen people use uh, awls to try to do this. Uh, this is a nice way to do it. So I'm feeding it through that loop again. And this time I'm going through the same hole. It should go pretty quick. So now my gold is on the back. And I need to have some thread on the back. So right here is where my, my gold is on the, the back now. Um, and I'd want to take this to a section that was already was already worked. Um, and then I just want to tack down well, I'm way far off. I need to bring my needle over here. I'm cheating all kinds of ways over here. My back does not look very pretty. I'm going to trust that none of you are going to judge me too harshly on that. Uh, but then I'm going to bring my stitches down. Um, and this is where having two hands is really, really helpful. So if I were doing using my uh, frame, I could have two hands. I could flip it over and I could do it that way but I'm just going to uh, encase these threads and some, some other threads, the gold threads, I'm gonna tack them down a bunch. I do it more than twice. I'm, I, I don't think you need to see me do a whole bunch. Once you have them done, then, you're gonna, then you can take your metal, your gold work scissors and snip. Uh, and then just whip stitch, you go around a lot more until it's, it's secure. So question on your green dragon that Master Seridwin did? Caridwin. Caridwin, sorry. Uh, sure. That, how did, how, so did she achieve the green color by uh, an underlay of the green first and nope. then couching over top or was that done with with the, the like couching of the gold with the green. That was done with the couching of the gold. Um, so, uh, I'll sh a trick with, uh, I don't see it anywhere on here. Um, well, I can see it much better now. It's all, it's all the couch. You can see the gold underneath. Uh, I don't, um, if you look. Oh, wow. It's, so she's just faced the couching closer to get more of the green with a gold sheen behind it right man that's really pretty if you look it's a really it's from your so subtle if you look right here yeah she's got what is that purple nope uh right here, there's you can see a bit of the padding that's underneath a okay trick, a trick when you're doing gold work is to use uh padding to use like felt um so like here's some felt it's gold. and then they they build up the layers? They build up the layers. So to Man, get- that's really cool. It has a 3D effect to it. So she would lay down, she might use some, uh, something like this maybe, some some yarn to give it, to be able to shape it some. And then maybe she used, she used felt in places to build up the, the body and the shape of the dragon. You just build it up over time. And then after she had the shape, how she wanted it, she ran, like you can see here, the stitches, are running this, like the gold work is just running along. It's not really doing- Almost like a topographical map. Yeah, so uh, back here it's going, but you can see where it's being raised up over uh, the tail. So I don't know if she did another- And that was done directly on the hood? Um, you know, I legitimately don't know. And then, I, then your, is your hood, does that go through the lining as well or is it? 
No, it's, it doesn't. Okay. Man, that's really cool. Uh, I'm going to bet that it was applicate on, but I, I don't know for certain what, what Kara Dwayne did. But maybe she, maybe she did. I, I have no desire to take it apart to find out. No, no, no. Either way, that's absolutely cool. Yeah, she did good stuff. Uh, so that was some gold work. We have 15 minutes left in the class. Um, is there anything else that, that people are interested in or want to uh, talk about? Yeah, if nobody else has anything, um, we talked a moment ago about not so pretty backs. Would you be willing to talk a little bit about Holbein stitch? Sorry, about what stitch? Holbein. Uh, I don't know that I've done a lot of that one, so I, I don't know that I can. Oh. Speak. No worries, thank you. Sorry. Question on needles. Yeah. When you're buying your needles, do you tend to go with a, an embroidery specific needle or a large eye or is there, or do you just have an assortment that you just try and figure out what you like best? It depends on what the project is. Um, man, I give that answer a lot that it depends, uh, but it, uh, it really does. So if I'm doing silk work, I'm going to be pure, or if I'm doing like gold, uh, if I'm doing silk, like uh, split stitch, I want a sharp needle. Uh, so I want some, I'm going to be coming up in between the, the threads. So an embroidery needle that's sharp is great for that. If I'm doing um, counted thread work, uh, I, especially if I'm using, sometimes it's done in, in wool or silk, I might want a dull needle because I don't really want to pierce the other stitches. I want to just kind of push them out of the way. Um, so I might use like a, more of a, a blunted needle. I don't know if I have an example to hand, um, but it depends on what your project is. Uh, you also need to have a needle that, um, that the eye is big enough to fit the, the fabric or the thread that you're using. Uh, if you have a really, really small needle that's, that's sharp and you're trying to get a big piece of wool through, that's gonna be a bad day for you. Um, so part of it's determined a little bit by what you're, what might be. Thanks. I was working on, um, not necessarily embroidery. I was doing, uh, I was using some of the sulky silk for my buttonholes on my coat hardy. And uh, because I was, it was linen, I was using a blunt and just pressing it through. And I was able to use a larger eye because I was using a three strand uh -huh. to, to get the fill. That sounds good. Thanks. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Okay, the last thing then uh, I'll talk about for just a, a minute or two is uh, a pattern layout about transferring. So say you have a picture and you wanna get onto another picture. You might wonder yourself, how the heck am I gonna do that? Well, there are there's a pure Paginino had uh, a document where he's showing well, that's upside down. You know, I bet I could just find this image real quick and show you. He's showing four different ways of transferring um, pattern transfer. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, so this is going to be from the, the 16th century. Is when this when this came about, um, and apparently they can find a uh, full book. So that's handy. Um, let's see if I can't blow this up. There we go. So we have four methods of pattern transfer here. We have using a candle underneath your your trestle. Um, which a, the modern equivalent to that would be to use a light box. Uh, I don't suggest using a candle underneath your thing uh, so you, you don't burn it down. Um, over here, they're using a window pane to do transfer. Uh, over here at the bottom left, she is using trick and pounce. So that's where you have your pattern drawn on one piece of paper and then you poke holes along the lines uh, and you take something called pounce and you, you like so you lay the piece over top, you sprinkle the pounce over top, and when you lift it up, 
you have uh, a dot matrix version of your, your pattern that you can then go back through with um, a pen or, or paint and transfer it that way. And then in the bottom right, uh, she has a small version of the pattern here. And then it's kind of like the, the grid or quadrant system that you did in like elementary school where you, you mark off the picture into boxes and then you, you, you draw out know, each box to get the, the bigger pattern. Um, so those are, are four ways of doing it in period. Uh, so I like to show that because I like to use a light box and uh, I think a light box is the equivalent of uh, a candle underneath your, your trussle. Um, any other questions? Nope. Kind of related to that. If your fabric is really dark, then what do you do? So that's the, the bane of life, right? Uh, yep. During dark. So there are, there's a handful of ways of doing that. Um, you could do prick and pounce and you could use chalk, like white chalk, and then you could lift and you could try it with a white chalk pencil or uh, you could get a little bit of like watercolor ink and like maybe paint it with gold, like a fine gold You could try, uh, or yellow color and try to mark it out that way. Um, that's one way of doing it. I have seen people you, uh, if you're not as worried about uh, period versus modern, I've seen people, uh, there's like this, this uh, paper kind of thing that you can print directly on that you can then iron onto your fabric that dissolves in water. Some people, I've never tried that, but some people seem to have good luck with that. Uh, I've, what I've done is I've, tran I've drawn out the pattern on tissue paper, transferred it over to tissue paper, and then I've sewn the tissue paper to the dark fabric um, with just like running stitches to kind of get the, the general outline. And then once I have that done, then I will pull and cut away the, the uh, tissue paper. Um, and then I have the the version I have I've transferred on the pattern that way that I can do the embroidery. Gotcha. Okay. Example of that if you, if you out here somewhere. Um. Any other questions while I'm looking for that? Uh, Drifa says she uses pat transfer ease and love it. Is that the um, the thing that you? Uh... It's the water soluble stuff. Yeah, where um, I don't run it through my printer. I just like trace it off a light box and then basically kind of press it on. It's like a sticker, and then I can sew through it. And then I just soak the item in water, and it all just dissolves away. It's wonderful. It also acts as a bit of a stabilizer too. So if I have if I'm working on like a fairly stable piece of fabric and I don't have a hoop, I don't need a hoop. Oh, that's good too. Uh, I thought that I had a picture. I made a couple of favors that had, that I did the tissue paper thing on and I can't find the picture of them. That's okay. I understand the concept at least. That's great. Uh, so we have just a couple minutes left. Um, I'm Kellick in the Middle Kingdom. And if you do embroidery and you want to show it to somebody, uh, you can absolutely show me. I love to see embroidery all the time. Um, it's one of my, my chief joys in life is to, to see embroidery. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a fighter. And there's a story, one of my, my good friends, the first time I met him, uh, I'm, I was in armor looking like a big scary knight. And uh, my friend, the, he, he's now my friend. This is the first time he met me. He came up and I looked at him. I said, your embroidery on your tunic is really nice. Did you do that? And he's like, no, my lady did it. And I'm like, well, tell her she does good work. Uh, so <laughs> um, it's never the wrong time to talk about embroidery.